mental health refers to a wide range of mental health conditions, disorders that affect your mood, your thinking, and your behavior. Many people across the world have mental illnesses from time to time, for example, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and addictive behaviors. In Zimbabwe, mental illnesses are not widely acknowledged and are associated with witchcraft or spiritual misfortunes. Although there are centers that facilitate for mental health patients, enough is not being done to accommodate patients suffering from different types of mental illnesses such as autism. This month of April, the Ministry of Health and Child Care has set aside this month to commemorate autism. Dr. S. M. Chirisa, a specialist psychiatrist, gives us the background. Autism is a mental condition that comes from abnormal brain development and is associated with difficulties in social interaction, uh, communication, and sometimes with abnormal behavior. And um, it is actually known as a autism spectrum disorder uh, because there are some patients that will do very well, some patients that are very serious. So it's a whole range of symptoms uh, where others will be able to function while others are severely disturbed. It's a condition that usually starts or is seen early in life. By definition, it is usually a diagnosis can be made by two years, but symptoms can appear uh, in the first year and it affects both boys and girls, but uh, more of the boys or the males uh, on a ratio of four is to one. Uh, I think it's also important to note that uh, autism is a lifelong condition. When it comes to the social interactions, what do you see? What are the symptoms? Early, it's obviously based on age, uh, but the hallmark is that the child prefers to be on their own. They don't want to be touched, they don't want to be cuddled, uh, they are indifferent to strangers, they are indifferent to their parents, they do not respond to their name when it is called, they do not turn when their name is called. They look as if they are called to affection, they look as if they are called to their caregivers. Uh, they prefer being alone. So even when they are playing, when the other kids are there, they tend to pick up their toys and go into their own corner and prefer uh, to be alone. They, they don't maintain eye contact. They don't speak that much, which means that language uh, can be a problem, not all the time, but usually language is underdeveloped or pure, purely developed, or they are real speech problems. They prefer sameness when they are used maybe to their porridge which is yellow or or brown when it is changed to another color they will resist it they will prefer certain foods or certain colored foods or certain texture um, uh, that's one of the things that we see one of the things that you might also see that they might be they might have hypersensitivity especially to noise while you are sitting they might actually hear they'll be very hypersensitive low noise or they can pick it up uh, but not always, but they can be hypersensitive to, uh, to, to noise, they'll, so they'll block their ears and you, under, you wonder what uh, they are hearing, but they are, uh, their brain is wired in such a way that they can be hypersensitive to, uh, to noise. It's a spectrum with a, a wide range of symptoms, but the hallmark, what I want to ma make the viewers understand is that there is abnormality in social interactions. There can be uh, abnormalities in speech and there can be abnormalities in their behavior that is seen. We want parents to come up early because you can pick the symptoms early in, uh, in, in childhood, early uh, in the early years, and things can actually be done. Parents are especially in our African context, they are very eager when something wrong is uh, with a the child. There is, there is a lot of belief 
of, of witchcraft, you know, punishment from God and all that. But it is not so. One of the things that we have seen is that when one of your child uh, is autistic, uh, the probability of having more autistic children is higher. So there's a genetic component. We've already seen that males are more prone to having autism than girls. So in terms of the ratio, it's four is to one to males. Uh, so being male also predisposes you to be autistic. One of the things that we've also seen is that with the advancement of medical practice, especially our pediatric care, uh, we have seen extreme pre-born surviving. Um, however, even though they might survive, some of them it also predisposes and they've got a high rate of autistic disorders or brain development disorders. So preterm is one of, of the things uh, that predispose to autism. Uh, there, there are various things, the environment, that can predispose. But remember that autism is a lifelong disease, which means that people that are autistic or you've got autism and are now adults. If they were missed in their childhood, they are now adults and they, are, they have got autism. And that diagnosis can still be made even when you are an adult. There is no medication, so you cannot uh, medicate or you're going to give medication to treat autism. No, there is no medication. The medication, if you are going to use medication, we are using medication to treat other things that usually come along with autism, like epilepsy or like a disruptive behavior or like um, ADHD, hyperactivity, attention disorder. All those things can, can be part of that and we can use medication. But there is no medication to treat autism. The best way to treat autism is what we call behavior modification. So a child is then trained uh, based on their strengths and based on their weaknesses. So what you do is you maximize the strengths of that child and you manage the weaknesses of that child. They can actually be trained how to speak, how to socialize with others, how to judge uh, what others are thinking in terms of social cues uh, from there. So the most important thing is that and it's easier to train somebody when they are young. It's easier to train somebody when they are young rather than to wait when they are old. So we actually prefer to start the training before the age of four. Some of you might be asking, what do we then do if we notice the symptoms that I have already alluded to? I think it is important to, to note that in the past uh, three, four years, government psychiatric units, namely Pararenia Psychiatric Unit Annex, and Arare Central Hospital uh, Psychiatric Unit have introduced uh, child psychiatry clinics. These are clinics which are focused on psychiatric illnesses or mental health issues that pertain to children, starting from all the age of zero up to the age of 12. And we are aging parents who suspect or who need these assessments done uh, to go to these clinics, they are on specific days, uh, and uh, it differs from hospital to hospital, but they are there. You are going to meet psychiatrists, psychologists, who will, and occupational therapists, who will assess your child uh, for free. For free. A psychiatric illness uh, treatment in this country is free at government hospitals. And also, uh, if there is need for them to get medication, if the medication is available at uh, the psychiatric hospital pharmacies, they will also get it for free. Um, however, we do know that uh, pediatric preparations for some of the medication are a bit difficult to get, but when it is there, you will be given for free. So let's not keep and cry and say there is no help. Let's use these free services. They are available. They are there. Those uh, who have got capacity or on medical aid, they can go to private psychiatrists and, and psychologists for assessment. And, but what we want is, we are saying that there should be no child in this country of ours, Zimbabwe, who has got a mental health issue and is denied access to treatment or denied access to assessment. And our desire is to help your child so that that disease we will not disable their future and, and that the negative effects of autism will be negated by the trainings and the help that you'll get.
Dr. Chirisa has highlighted this condition, but what does a person under the spectrum go through and the people directly affected? Mrs. Nyashanu, a mother of two boys, under the spectrum gives us hands-on experience on the journey she has taken. My name is Sike Nyashanu. I'm a mom of two boys affected by autism. Um, the eldest one is in form four right now. He's on the mild side. And then the younger one, Daryl, is on the severe end of the spectrum. So I'm going to speak quite a bit about Daryl. For Bradley, there really isn't much. Yes, he's got his challenges. But when we are comparing him to Daryl, Daryl has got more things that I'm able to share. So for him, in terms of our journey, for us to get diagnosis, it was quite something. I don't know how many pediatricians we visited. The main red flag for us was he didn't go past uh, the bubbling stage. So for him, he up until he was uh, 12 months old when he had just turned one i could see that there was something amiss with him but i couldn't really pinpoint what it was but for us the main red flag was his failure to begin to speak so we then started visiting different pediatricians to find out what was going on with him so that's basically our journey but up until he was about three and a half, almost turning four, we hadn't yet received a diagnosis for him. The main red flag, as I said, is your child not meeting milestones at the expected time. It is very important for parents to look and compare their child with other children who fall within the same age range. If there is anything that makes you think, mm, maybe my child is not really meeting the criteria in the age level. I really encourage parents to go and have their children assessed. So that journey, when you are looking at your child and you are seeing what, ha, my child is not different from the other children, but in terms of his development, you can tell that there is something that is quite amiss. And because of that, you also get instances where children with autism, they also come with behavior problems. They would throw these huge tantrums and so on. And you as a parent, you have to deal with all of that. And you also have to explain to extended family who are asking, what is happening with this child? Is it Kuroiwa? Is it something that happened? You have to deal with all of that. But one thing that I've realized is if you've got a, a support structure in terms of you, I'm pretty lucky that my husband is very, very supportive. And his background is he's a psychologist. He did psychology. But for him, we always laugh that when it came to Daryl, he didn't immediately see that there was something. But when we then got the diagnosis and stuff, that's when he only said, oh, I learned this at school. But it's been quite something. I've also taken an opportunity because of that to go out and make awareness campaigns to talk about autism, just to educate the community on what autism is and what it exhibits in. For example, one of the main things that I always say is those with autism, they don't have any physical challenges. So for someone with, say, cerebral palsy, for example, immediately you can see that this child is with a disability. But when it comes to autism, it's an invisible disability, so to speak. So I think it is the, the main job of parents to educate everyone who comes into contact with their children. When Daryl came, I think it was now, I was now, and I was oh, okay, these things can happen. But on Bradley, we never noticed that there was something, um, his development was not quite up to scratch. 
maybe because we also didn't have another child to compare him with. He would do things like um, maybe he would come and with a packet of chips and then he would say, Mom, can you please open for me? Then maybe he was four or five. I'll just take it and open it for him and give him. Not really thinking that, ah, but other four-year-olds, other five-year-olds are able to do all that. We would just do it. It was only when he went for a grade one interview, when we were now getting ready for him to go to school. The first year he went for the interview, they said to us, ah, he's not yet ready. He needs to go back to preschool for another year. Then we'll call you back the following year. Then we did that. So the second time round, they then called us. And then they said to us, we noticed there's something amiss. We can't really put our finger putting the upper, but there's something not quite right because we've compared the work that he did last year and the work that he did today. We've only seen that he, he hasn't improved and yet he had another year in preschool. So he only had six things that he knew from the previous year and on that year. So they then referred as they then said to us, as it is right now, we cannot give you a place. So we want you to take your child for assessment. So we were then referred to go to St. Giles. That then began the whole journey. We then went there, they did the assessment, and then their first diagnosis was learning disabilities. The diagnosis of autism, it only came three years after that, after we had gone with him for another assessment in South Africa. But when Daryl came, by the time he got to 12 months, I was already seen because I had been exposed to the other children with different um, conditions at St. Giles. So our initial, our first visit to St. Giles, it was out of my own initiative. I did not wait to do, uh, to go to different doctors to refer to us. So I immediately went with him to St. Giles, but then they said to us, ah, 12 months is a bit too early. Let's wait until he turns two. If he doesn't speak by then, then you need to bring him in, then we do another assessment. And then we went back there, they said he needed to undergo uh, speech therapy. But for him, he would get so agitated getting into that place. So that resulted in us only doing therapies for three months, I think. And then afterwards, we had to stop because it was not working out. But for me as a mom, I got to a point where I then said, um, it was after the three months of trying to go to therapy, I came back home and I said, Lord, I am giving back this child to you. You are the one who created him. You know everything about him. But because I've done everything that I can as a parent. I think I had gotten to that space where you've done everything and you are seeing it's not it's not working out. But um, I think four months later or so, I just had this an easy feeling any help. That then led us to Dr. Powell and then Dr. Powell then referring us to go to South Africa. But when we went there, I should also mention that one of the challenging behaviors that he had was aggression. I love Daryl. And Tese Taitoroa and you know what that was one of my challenges and So when we got to South Africa, Patakaita assessment, I remember my husband saying to them, if only you can deal with the head banging, the aggression, I will be good. Even as long as we will be happy with that. So it's been quite, quite a journey. And one thing I've also realized is, yes, you may get to a point here, Kuti, I've accepted Manawangu as he is. But in any from the practical side, I've noticed, Kuti, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Paranoid among my challenging behaviors, you get to a point here, Kuti, Pamonongo, Chema, 
and then from my show no more hey is she nyanya but you always have to pick up yourself dust yourself and then you have to move on one of the things that i also did when i came back from south africa was to establish a private voluntary organization what we mainly do is offer psychosocial support to parents who have children with special needs so at, in that platform we also give out information on where to go daryl an 11 year old boy he goes to school lives with his parents his older brother and has a dog he enjoys watching television youtube videos and playing with his toys he loves to help around he packs his lunch box he doesn't forget to clean up if he messes around daryl pretty much does typical boy stuff daryl is autistic having a child with autism is not the end of the world autism in fact opens up a lot of doors for you because you then get you have that thirst you put ah, i really want to know more i never imagined that i would be a teacher never in a million years but i'm actually enjoying it because i'm seeing my son develop in a way in a chito shanisa we always say you as the parent you are the greatest therapist for your child and you are the one who will advocate to see change for your child so autism parents let's go um for us we took the option of homeschooling because kuchoro we were seeing that um it was not happening for him my important skills like him being able to bath himself dress himself cook for himself all those given the severity of his condition. So we then decided that um, he needs that one-on-one -on -one attention, which is impossible when he's at school. That's why we decided to start homeschooling him. So when we started, all those things, Jandataura, he was not able to do all that. I remember the first program, Yandakami Tira, I was saying for the first six months, I just need him to be able to bath himself and to dress himself. That was mostly what we were doing. So we then had to break that down until Taona Kuti Anga Akubwana. By the end of the first year, he was now able to do all that. So the main advantage of homeschooling is because your child will get to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, attention. Yeah, Dero, Uncle Nyasha is here. Please go and open the gate for him. Where are you? Hi. Hi, Dario. Dario, hi. hi. How are you? How are you? Hi. Say I'm fine. Hi. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Mm. You need to put on your shoes. Thank you. Uncle Nyasha, Daryl's therapist, comes in three times a week. To help him with his schoolwork and speech. Hi, Uncle Yasha. Hi, hi. Good you can put them on the table. These ones from the table. Sit Can you sit nicely? In a few seconds, it's going to be my turn, okay? Do it. All right, I'm going to give you a few seconds because you said no wait. In five, four, four three, two. two one my half. 
everything. You can put them. Okay. okay, we need to do something. Then you play with your cars. Or you need to put them all there. Few seconds, stereo. Yeah? I need you to tell me what this girl is doing. Eating. Eating, well done, that's eating. High five. If he does something that is good to reinforce him, like for example, high five. I need to be motivating in order to teach him. We say these kids, um, every child can learn something. And if he doesn't learn something, it means something is wrong with the teacher or the environment. Everyone is capable of learning uh, except if there is cognitive inability or physical inability. That is the only two things that can stop someone from learning, but every child can learn. So to motivate them to keep on doing is through reinforcement. Reinforcement is key. Okay, Dario. You know what? If if you if you want to play for more time, you can say more time. Look at me. More time. More time. Okay, you can you can play. And also, what I did um, because we are encouraging them functional communication. Uh, if he's play, if he's playing with uh, something that he likes. You can ask for more time, you can ask for... You can say no, it's okay to say no, but not to overuse it. That's why sometimes I ignore the no wait, because he knows that no wait, it means wait, I need to play with uh, my, my stuff. But sometimes I ignore it because he's overusing it. In five, four, three, two, one. Can you put everything there? Okay, look look at this number. What number is this? Two. Two. Well done. High five. Good. In Zimbabwe, there are those who are trying to make a difference. Pathway Autism Trust. We caught up with Flora, one of the parents who started this initiative to help children under the spectrum. Beginning in 2013, when we first started, this had been a residential cottage which had some tenants in it. And when the tenants left, we asked Mbuya Chinaire if we could take this cottage and use it to convert into our school. We had been around Harare and asked around for the rental prices of property to, to have a, a dedicated place and we couldn't afford it. So we decided to convert this um, space into the center. It was dilapidated, it was empty. We ourselves did the work of first painting this place and trying to make it into something that was hospitable. And then we opened it in 2014 and we had it blessed by a priest in the Catholic Church and we put some of our own furniture in here. For example, the, the uh, table and benches there, the small chairs in the morning room center. And gradually we got donations for the furniture and yeah. We thank God that 
things have progressed since that time. Pathways Autism Trust was initiated by parents. We ourselves are parents of a child who is now turning 20 this year, Tawana. Uh, our friends who came with us, not all of them have gone through the, the rest of the journey with us, but we had a group of parents, three families who came together, ourselves, the Tulibanos, the Zibandos. All of them have a child on the autism spectrum. She takes us on a tour around the school, explaining the special learning process. And a workstation is like a desk in an office. It has an inbox and an outbox. It has a child's picture, name, and color. And the color is the same color that you see on the, um, the locker, the same color you see on his plate, his cup, his placemat, Everything will be that same color, so he knows this is my identity. Now at a workstation, the child is trained to work from left to right, from top to bottom, in every task that they do. So it must be very logical, very sequential, and very structured. And they must work according to that visual schedule. I'll just try to simulate uh, an example of a day. It'll start with morning ring, okay? They'll be in a circle in the classroom and he has his teacher, Cynthia. So there they are in morning ring. And it will end with goodbye song. In between, there will be many activities, including going to the toilet. They may be doing activities of daily living. This one. Washing up after eating. Okay. Eating, then washing up after eating. Together with his teacher, right? Before he does this task, the teacher will show him, you are going to do this. Then he does it. 15 minutes, the teacher will come back with him. One-on-one, -on -one, he'll remove this card and put it into the pocket. Then the teacher will say, now you're going to water the garden. He does that for 15 minutes. They come back and then again, they're going to remove the card together, put it in the pocket. And so he goes through the day like that. Until finally at the end of the day, they come to a goodbye song. So it might be activities of daily living, it might be toileting, it might be washing, eating, Cleaning up, he's going to be shown what he's doing first before he does it, and then he's going to take it off and put it away. Even if the child wants something now, which is often the children want something now, we teach them here, yeah, look, first work, then play. Nothing is left to chance to say, this is a draw. <laughs> so we have to multitask and the classrooms are multifunctional. This is the children, the, the junior's class, but for now, it's set up as in full morning room. This is the children's work and most of it is done hand on hand, together with the assistance of the teachers. So. Each child will be assigned their own teacher, and the teacher helps the child, literally hand on hand, to do these works of art and construct, you know, these um, arts and crafts. This chart here is the rules, very simple rules. Everything can be removed and replaced with Velcro. So if a child is not looking, we're going to show the child this picture and say, look, and then we can put it back. Sitting, we've had children who've come to the center who, for two weeks, couldn't just sit down. Couldn't sit down for more than five seconds. And then we have to get it up to five minutes, then 15 minutes and we have to show the child how to sit. 
and we show them the picture and then we make them sit down. And that's the sign language sign for sit down. Washing up and cleaning up is a roster that we have for the children. And we put it onto a visual roster like that. So each day there'll be somebody doing that activity. Whenever the bell rings, the children will assemble in this square and then they'll be told what they're going to do and then they go and do it. And it may be just going for a walk or going for their next lesson or going to the toilet. But they must assemble in here and then they'll be given a small reward in the form of a tiny piece of a, a sweet that we'll cut off, you know, cut into small pieces. They assemble here and then they go and do the assigned task. So, the other same task may be going to the toilet. It's important to note is that they have a visual schedule showing how to use the toilet, a sequence, how enter the bathroom, use the toilet, flush, check clothes, buy soap, wash hands. They also have a visual schedule of how to wash their hands. Their motto is, explore my world, unlock my potential. It comes from the fact that those on the autism spectrum are often considered to be in their own world. So, rather than forcing the child to come into our world, we want to get into their world. We want to explore their feelings and their experience of the world as they see it, explore my world, and then we unlock their potential. These children, some of them are geniuses. We have a child here um, who the, the staff called um, engineer because he had that potential, you know, the ability to work with small gadgets and work with computers. You have children here who can do um, perform music, who can do so many things. A, a child who could do three-dimensional art creations of vehicles, you know. Sometimes the children are very gifted. Not always, but each child has got their own potential. They've got their own thing that they're interested in, and we will unlock that potential individualized with each child. I just want everybody who watches this documentary and hears this message to understand where we're coming from as parents and as an organization. I want to encourage every mother of a child with autism to be proud of your child, to believe in that child's potential, never give up, just embrace the child and be positive because no one can underestimate the capacity of the human mind and no one can be the best advocate for your child other than the mother. And I'm speaking right now as a mother.